Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. Today we're going to set up that skeleton spawner as a permanent experience farm. I'm going to grab this now empty chest and take that with me. We're going to return to the cave and track down where that spawner was. Oh, on the way down this cave, I've spotted a slime. So we're going to kill the slime just so it drops some slime balls. Anyway, here we are at the skeleton spawner. The first thing we're going to do is break these two chests and move all of the contents somewhere else. Then we're going to start breaking out the walls and the floor of this dungeon room that it generates in. We want this to be a 9x9 nine nine square centered on the spawner, so I usually mark this out with torches, four coming out from each side and one under the center. Looks like we need to dig out this wall here and this one over here to get this room the shape we want it. We're going to carve out the floor so there's at least two blocks of room below the spawner. I think for safety's sake I'm going to go with three. Then we're going to make sure all of the walls and the floor are made out of solid material and that there aren't any gaps in here anywhere. And it might be a good idea to swap this out for a solid material that you can recognize that isn't part of natural generation. That way you don't accidentally dig into the spawner whilst you're mining around here. On one side of the room, it doesn't really matter which side, we're going to dig a two block deep trench. And that trench will be nine blocks long, but on the ninth block, we're going to dig that down into a two block deep hole as well. If you're digging around in deep slate layers, you're likely to uncover some precious resources in the process. So we're going to harvest those, especially now we have Fortune 3. Ten diamonds from that, <laughs> not bad. Eventually, we'll enclose this entire area in these bricks, but for now, we're going to pause to go and get some water. We'll start an infinite water source nearby, and we can go and grab another bucket of water from somewhere in the cave. Looks like there's a water source here we can grab, otherwise you can go to the surface or find a lake. And we're going to create a row of water source blocks that flow down towards the trench on the other side of the room. We're going to put one water source block at the end of the trench that will flow down towards that hole, and this is going to direct the skeletons that spawn into a water stream that will drop them off where we want them. Then we're going to dig down to exactly where that hole comes out. We're going to dig this down at least one or two more blocks to make sure... Oh, wow, there's a lot of resources here. <laughs> but we're going to make sure the skeletons, when they fall down here, have a little drop that they can fall into. We're going to have them land on a block like this so all we can see is their feet and we can swipe at those with a sword. Then we're going to make sure we have easy access to that area from one of the caves nearby. Then with the walls around here built up to an adequate height, we can remove any light from the center of the spawner. The skeletons will notice me right now, but as we continue to build the wall up around here, they will drop on down into this area where right now they're trying to shoot at each other, but we can simply attack them with a sword a couple of times until they die and drop their experience. The most important thing is to remember that no light enters the spawner, so if there's any gaps anywhere and there might be torch light shining through, make sure that those are closed off. Make sure that the area behind you is safe as well. If you're going to be standing at this thing waiting for skeletons to build up, you don't want zombies sneaking up on you. And last of all, wherever you're standing when you're using the farm, make sure you are within a 16 block radius of the spawner. We've already carved out a 4 block radius around the spawner, so make sure that you are standing within 12 blocks of that box. Right now, if we're standing here, the skeletons can't see us, but if we walk right up to this, a couple of them will be able to see you and potentially shoot you. So you might want to include a slab right here so that you can just attack the skeleton's legs. You can hold crouch to step underneath it. Alternatively, have the skeletons fall onto a slab so that you don't have to do the crouching. And with me standing back here, the skeletons haven't noticed a thing. After just killing a few skeletons here, I've already got 31 bones and my levels are back up to 18. So it's pretty clear that this is a good source of XP and bones here in the early game. You'll almost certainly want to have a chest nearby so that you can drop off all of the excess items from these spawners. The bones are almost always going to be worth saving, but I find you get a ton of arrows and half broken broken bows from these, which might be worth keeping because we can do some stuff with them later, but right now they're just going to take up a ton of space. One last thing you'll almost certainly want to do is take the coordinates of the area we're standing down here. That way, you can dig down from the surface to create a ladder that will safely bring you to the spawner without having to navigate the caves. And in my case, that's actually back over here next to this river by spawn. We are standing basically on one of the blocks that we can dig straight down from. Digging straight down is almost always an unsafe thing to do in Minecraft, so we are going to stand on the line between these two two blocks and dig out one side and then the other. That way, if there's any unsafe falls below you, if there's a drop into lava or into a large cave, you'll be able to see them before they happen and make preparations accordingly. In this case, it seems like the most unsafe thing that happens on the way down is we run into a patch of water, which is easy enough to deal with. We simply place blocks surrounding the area we want to dig down through, place blocks to fill up the water and then remove them, which should mean the water is gone as well. In my case, we got lucky and that patch of water was the only thing we had to deal with on the way down here. There's even some skeletons waiting here for me as I arrive. You will, of course, want to bring a couple of stacks of ladders with you so you can make a safe ladder back up to the surface. But that, at its most basic, is how you can set up a skeleton or a zombie spawner. Bearing in mind that if you've got a zombie spawner, baby zombies can sometimes spawn, so you don't want to leave any one-block gaps that they could run out and hit you. Spider spawners are a little bit different because they're a different size, so we have to accommodate that in the spawner design. But stick around for the rest of the video where we'll discuss ways we can make this skeleton spawner even more effective.
Hey folks, welcome back, and I've noticed a couple more slimes spawning in this cave. So I'm going to kill them because one of the modifications we can make to this spawner, which is going to make it really effective for us to use, is one that will require us to get hold of some slime balls. If you haven't found any slimes in a cave or a swamp yet, don't worry, I'll also provide an option for people who haven't found slime. And this option is definitely the more simple of the two, although it does rely on you having enough experience, because we're going to re-roll the enchantment table until the sweeping edge enchantment appears. Specifically, you will want sweeping edge three. If you're a Minecraft Java Edition player, you've probably noticed on a couple of occasions that when you attack something, there is this sweeping animation that plays in front of you. You end up with this kind of swoosh of air. And that's not just for special effects, that is to indicate that you are doing a sweeping attack, which can hit multiple mobs in front of you. Unfortunately, by default, not all of these mobs are going to be hit with the same attack power. The one directly in front of you is going to receive the bulk of the attack, but the others are only going to take a small amount of damage, and you'll need to keep attacking them over and over again in order to deal fatal damage damage. That changes with the Sweeping Edge enchantment, which at level 3 allows you to do 100% of the damage that you're dealing to the mob in front of you to all of the other mobs hit in the range of that sweep attack. So while I'm having to effectively kill these skeletons one at a time as they appear in the spawner here, we can end up with a Sweeping Edge sword which deals 100% of the damage we're dealing every single time and can clear large groups of skeletons very easily. Another option is to have the skeletons take enough fall damage that you can kill them all with a single point of damage, effectively get them to the range where you could kill them with a single punch. That way every swing of your sword, no matter whether you have sweeping edge or not, will kill all of the skeletons in the spawner because they're all on like half a heart of health basically. And the way you would do that is by channeling all of the skeletons into a column of water that's going to transport them upwards and then drop them downwards. Because remember, we can't stand 23 blocks away from this spawner. We need to be within 16 blocks in order for it to activate. So we send the skeletons from here up a column of water, across a couple of blocks, and then drop them down into the area where we kill them. Unfortunately, that option isn't available to us right now, because skeletons used to simply float upwards in a solid column of water, but now they sink in water, so we would need something to propel them upwards. It is mechanically possible to do that, but it requires going to the nether and acquiring some very specific blocks, and we haven't been to the nether yet in this series. We're probably going to do that in tomorrow's episode. So in the meantime, I'm going to use options C, which is to solve this problem with redstone. We're actually going to dig this area down a couple more blocks because we will need to build some circuitry, and I'm going to be very specific about the instructions here because for our first redstone contraption, this is going to be a little complicated. But as far as the skeleton killing experience goes, it's going to be a pretty major upgrade. So I'm going to continue building this ladder all the way back up to the surface, go and grab a few redstone ingredients, and then we'll be back to explain how to build this. Okay, so despite this being a slightly more complicated redstone build, the requirements are actually relatively simple. This little section of my inventory over here should have more or less everything we need to get this thing built. We need a handful of natural stone, like five or six should be enough. We've got a stack of redstone dust here that we're gonna be converting into a few different redstone components. I brought some spruce logs that we can break down into planks and slabs and all that kind of stuff. I brought nine iron for some really specific ingredients we need to craft here. And we got some glass, because glass and redstone have this interesting interaction, which I'll explain in a moment. First of all, I'm going to close this off to make sure it's safe in here, and we're going to turn to our crafting table. We're going to break a bunch of these spruce logs down into planks. We're going to find the piston crafting recipe, and we're going to make four of those using whatever materials we have to hand. I'll also briefly make a wooden button to demonstrate how pistons work. Pistons effectively push blocks around, so if we power a piston with a redstone power source nearby, it's going to extend, and then when the power goes away again, it will retract. Now, normal pistons, when they push a block away from them like so, the block stays in the position it was pushed to. But we're going to craft three of these into sticky pistons using the slime balls. And the useful thing about sticky pistons is when they push a block, they will also pull the block back towards them. And the first thing we're going to do is dig upwards so that we have two blocks gap between where the skeletons are flowing in that water stream and where they are falling down here. We're going to carve out a niche in the wall and place a sticky piston in this space right here. Then we're going to leave a solid block here and place two more sticky pistons just below that here and here. And after that, we're going to remove this block because that block is going to get in the way of some of the redstone that needs to happen. I'm actually going to remove a couple of the deep slate bricks we've been using here so I can attach some glass to the outside of this and we can watch the skeletons fall down in here once the farm is complete. It will also be easier to see what happens next because we're going to grab a bow, we're going to grab some redstone and some cobblestone, and we are going to craft a dispenser. There are two different types of redstone components which can spit out blocks. One of them is called a dropper, which is crafted without a bow, and one is called a dispenser, which is crafted with a bow. The cool thing is you can use some of the leftover skeleton bows from the spawner 
to make a dispenser. We don't have to craft a bow from scratch. The dispenser is going to go in here, facing towards us and one block out from the sticky pistons. Now using the stone cutter, we're going to make a couple of different blocks. These are just for aesthetics. I'm going to make a chiseled deep slate block and we already have some deep slate brick slabs, so I guess we will use those. We're going to attach the chiseled deep slate to that first sticky piston at the top there and the two slabs attached to the top and bottom faces of these two sticky pistons. Then we can close this tube back up again. We're going to turn to our crafting table. We're going to craft a couple more planks so that we can make a chest and using the remaining five iron, we are going to make a hopper. A hopper is a redstone component that collects items that fall on top of it. They can also collect items directly from an inventory above them. So this hopper is filling up with the bows from this chest that I've placed here. And if a hopper is attached to its chest with the output pointing in towards the chest, it can actually deposit items into that inventory. So in this case, we're going to build a chest alongside our contraption here, and the hopper is going to be facing into the chest. And one of the cool things about hoppers is they can still collect items through non-solid blocks like slabs. So all of the stuff I just threw in there has now been transferred into this chest. Using the stone cutter, we're going to make a deep slate brick wall out of some of these bricks I already have. And in our crafting interface, we're going to turn two of the stone we have here into a stone pressure plate. Then I'm going to turn back to my crafting table and make a few more redstone components that we need. We will need three redstone torches. Two of those are going to go back into the crafting table along with a redstone dust and three natural stone to make a redstone repeater. And we're going to put our deep slate wall here in front of the hopper and then we're going to dig out the floor a little bit. We'll dig a trench two blocks deep and five blocks long and we'll also open out this area by a couple of blocks here. Underneath here, we're going to place place three redstone dust, so the last one is under the hopper. We're going to place a redstone repeater here, and then we're going to dig out this block and place a piston. That piston needs to have a block on it which is affected by gravity, so we need to get hold of either some sand or some gravel. Luckily down here in the deep slate layers of the world, gravel is fairly common, so there's a block of that right nearby. We're going to place the gravel on there, put two redstone dust leading out of that, one redstone dust leading out of here, and we'll break down more of this wood into planks so that we can place one here with a redstone torch sitting on top. In fact, this is probably a good moment to make sure that all of the redstone we place here ends up going on blocks which are not native to this cave, so that we can make sure we don't accidentally displace any of it if we come back through here and dig this place up. Now we're going to dig out the ceiling of this area to make sure that we can place a few more components leading upwards. We'll craft a bunch of these spruce planks into slabs because this allows us to create a staircase out of redstone dust. An important thing to understand about redstone dust is that while it can travel up a block like so, if you place a solid block above that, then the redstone dust here will be cut off. But if you place a non-solid block like a slab in this space, it will not. And strangely enough, even though the two are not connected, it is possible for redstone power to travel up through slabs. This is also true of other transparent blocks like glass. That's not what we're using the glass for right here, but we will in a moment. Anyway, attached to the side of this redstone torch, we're going to place a slab there and a slab there. We'll put two redstone dust on those. So you'll notice this redstone dust here curves around and connects, but the powered redstone here does not power this redstone below it. So the power can travel upwards, but not downwards when you're using these non-solid blocks. We are going to dig out the two blocks behind this slab here so that we can place two more blocks. We'll actually get the lapis out of the wall here. We might as well. We'll fill that back up again with tough because it doesn't matter too much if that ends up getting removed. But what we're going to do here is dig up a little further and dig out the blocks behind these pistons because some of these are going to have redstone components on them as well. These two solid blocks are going to have redstone dust placed on them. We're going to place one more solid block here, and we'll craft one more redstone torch to place on top of this block. You'll notice that that powered this bottom sticky piston very briefly, and that was a short enough redstone pulse that the slab in front of it became detached from the sticky piston head. That's unusual, and that's something we can use to our advantage in future, but will not be what we're using it for in this mechanism. We're going to put a solid block over the top of this redstone torch, another solid block here, and then a block of glass directly behind the piston. You'll notice that we have a one block gap between this glass and where the water is flowing above, and it's important not to let water flow down here because it can wash away all of this redstone dust. So the redstone dust will go on top of this glass block, on top of the solid blocks, right there and right there, and then we can remove any blocks that we were using to pillar up here. Now we should be able to fill in the rest of these blocks, but it's important to make sure they aren't cutting off any redstone dust anywhere when you fill up the rest of these blocks here. So if we put a block up there, for example, that would cut off the redstone dust. We need to leave that open. Next, we're going to build another staircase of slabs alongside this wall. So two blocks up from this redstone dust here, we're going to place another slab there. We're going to hop up onto that one so we can place another slab here, another slab there, and finally, we're going to place a solid block, probably another wooden plank here, connected to the side of the dispenser block. Then we're going to add redstone dust onto each of the slabs 
and this plank we have just placed, and you should hear the dispenser click for the first time. The last thing we'll do is right click on this redstone repeater to set it to two ticks, which will delay the signal coming out into this block, which will power this piece of redstone here. And then we can fill in some more of the blocks around here, once again making sure that we aren't cutting off any redstone dust that's traveling up over the side of a block. Finally, we're going to fill in our deep slate bricks along the floor, and we're going to place a pressure plate right here in front of the wall. And now when we step onto this, a couple of things should happen. That block up there and the slab below it should be pushed outwards, and you'll hear the dispenser click as though it's trying to do something, but right now it doesn't have any contents. Once we step off, the dispenser will click again and those blocks will retract. We're also going to add this slab back in here attached to that sticky piston, and we can bring a couple more deep slate blocks down here, although I think we'll use some stairs on this right hand side because that will make sure that we can still open the chest. So now this mechanism should be fully working. The one thing we still need to get hold of is a bucket of lava. To to go into the dispenser. But once again, luckily for us, we are down low in deep slate caves and lava is basically everywhere. So I'm going to swipe a bucket from this nearby lake. Then we're going to return to our contraption, dig out one of these deep slate bricks so that we can look at the dispenser. You'll notice it has nine available slots for items. We're going to make sure one lava bucket gets put in here and then we're going to close this up again. So now when we step on the pressure plate, lava is dispensed in that central block. And when we step off the pressure plate, it retracts again. If you followed all of my instructions here, okay, this should now be safe to use. But just in case you want to study the redstone a bit more, I'll put a world download for this contraption in the video description. And I should also give credit for this original design to a YouTuber named Derp Crafter. I modified this slightly from their original design, but I will leave a link to that video in the description. This is a design I've been using since Minecraft 1.8, and it has never let me down yet. So now to demonstrate how this works, we're going to bust out the wall here and remove that torch, which should immediately start the skeletons spawning in there. Now we can see the skeletons are piling up inside of this tube, and watch what happens when we step on the pressure plate. These slabs get pushed out at head height and foot height for the skeletons. The lava up there isn't damaging them yet, but a single swipe of the sword will be enough to send them all up into the lava. They all burn up, but their experience drops out the bottom on top of this slab. Any items they would drop also arrive on top of that slab and get pulled through the hopper into this chest on the right hand side where our torch that we just broke out is. So none of the drops or experience are burned in the lava. They're all preserved. And once we step off, any skeletons that have started to pile up can be dropped down into the system and we can use it again. So without any need to create a long fall for these skeletons so that they're on a single point of damage, we've created a system that will kill all of these skeletons with a single swing of the sword. We don't even need to use our sword here. We could punch all of the skeletons individually and they'd still die in much the same way. We could also use this setup in a zombie spawner because the wall in front of us actually prevents baby zombies from getting out of the system. But as I mentioned before, if the redstone here seems a little intimidating to you, you have the option of getting a sweeping edge sword or going to the nether for some soul sand so you can propel the skeletons upwards in the world and have them fall 23 blocks to take enough damage that you can kill them in one hit. But the advantage this system has over the fall damage model is that armor isn't going to protect skeletons from lava, where it might protect them from a little of the fall damage. Anyway, now we're back at 30 levels, it's probably time to do some enchanting. And since it's such a long way to our house, we're going to expand the space out enough to include its own enchanting setup, because it's actually quite a long way back to my house from here, and every time we reach 30 levels, I don't want to have to run all the way home to enchant stuff and then run all the way back. Hey folks, welcome back. So I started doing a bit of decoration and I was lucky enough to find a couple of diamonds in the floor here. So we're going to dig those up. We'll get a few extra diamonds from that. And I've been putting together the ones that I've got from digging up diamonds in the area, putting them in this chest here because we're going to have an enchanting setup. And I figured since the diamonds spawned in the floor there, it was kind of fate that we should put our enchanting table on that spot. So I'll pop that in there. I've been using these deep slate tiles to decorate the rest of the area. And through a bit of trial and error, I basically worked out that this white border that I've placed here is the area that we have to stand within for the spawner in there to be active. Anywhere outside of that, we get 16 blocks away from the spawner and it shuts down. So it's a good idea to mark out on the floor or at least have some idea of the area in which the spawner will still be active. So there are a couple of skeletons that have made their way down into the drop shoot because they spawned whilst I was killing that last set. But as you can see, I'm standing here no more skeletons coming through. And one last thing I have been meaning to check is if we open up the spawner. Yep, no, it's happened. Okay. <laughs> well, those skeletons are just going to fight each other for a second, and then we're going to light up the area very briefly to deal with this problem. So the way these mob spawners work is that a 9x9 area around the spawner, centered on the spawner, 
is going to generate these mobs, but they can generate one block above or one block below the spawner. They don't need to spawn on solid blocks, so most of the time they'll spawn in midair and drop down into the water, unlike regular mobs on the surface which need to spawn on a solid block. But the reason we have this water clearing them out of the area as quickly as possible is because the spawner detects whether or not there are still any skeletons in this area before it decides to spawn more of them. And so if there are skeletons standing on top of the spawner block, it will detect they are there and it will choose not to spawn more. By placing a slab on top of the spawner, we prevent mobs from spawning up there and hopefully we shouldn't end up with any more skeletons just hanging out on top of the spawner. So that should make our spawner a little bit more productive as long as we're standing within the lines of these bone blocks, which by the way, I should probably explain what those are. If you break down bones into bone meal and get nine bone meal, you can recraft that into a bone block, which not only acts as a building block, but can be long-term storage for bone meal once you acquire a lot of it, which now we've got a skeleton spawner, we have a virtually limitless supply of bone meal, which is very good news for any crop farms that we build in the near future. One other thing that's worth noting, I put a water source block down here so that we can drop directly down from the surface. And while it might be terrifying dropping about a hundred blocks to reach this, if we land squarely in the water, we won't take any fall damage. So instead of the tedious process of coming down this ladder every time we return to the spawner, we can just drop down from the surface and be there almost instantly. Still take a really long time to climb back up to the surface though, so I might put a bed down there just so I can make sure it's daytime by the time we resurface. And for the final decorative touches, I think I'm going to go back to the house and grab some mangrove wood. Okay, and a short time later we are now basically done decorating this spawner, and enough skeletons have actually built up in here that when we end up with a couple more dropping down, you'll notice they all suddenly take damage and one of them will die. That's going to happen in just a second. Yep, there we go. And that is entity cramming at work. That is a Minecraft mechanic that prevents more than 24 mobs from being in the same place at once. If they're all standing in the same block, one of them will end up taking damage until only 24 remain. And so if we just stand here, we can passively farm bones this way, but we won't get any experience from that. And that was kind of the whole point of this farm. So it's always worth just stepping forward, making sure that the XP is taken care of and all of the bones and whatnot will end up in this chest. My inventory is a mess right now, but I put in a bit of storage in the side wall here so that we can put in any of the bows, arrows and bones and whatnot that we want to keep. We could always compact the bones down into bone blocks for easier storage. And of course, over here, we have the enchanting setup, making sure that we can enchant our tools now that we've got a decent source of XP. And you know what? We might as well do a little bit of that now. I need to put something on this shovel. The pickaxe is also showing Unbreaking 3, so let's see what we get on a shovel enchantment. Efficiency 4 on Breaking 3, that's kind of perfect for the shovel actually. Now let's see what this brings up, just Efficiency 4, but we've got 33 levels, so we might as well give that a try. Looks like another Efficiency 4 on Breaking 3. Well, we need to install a grindstone down here so that we can get the enchantments off some of these tools and get some new stuff going on, but we also have 14 diamonds waiting in the chest here so we can craft ourselves a bunch more equipment. In fact, I'm going to drop off all of my building supplies in here for the time being. I can collect those a little bit later. We're going to grab the diamonds from here and we're going to start making our first diamond armor. Much like iron tools to diamond tools, this is going to be a pretty sincere upgrade from our iron armor to diamond armor. Let's see what we should make first. We have six diamonds left if we make a chest plate. We have seven if we make leggings. If we make a helmet and some boots, we'll end up with five diamonds left. So we'll keep hold of those for now, but I think the helmet and the boots are going to be crucial. We'll return for the leggings and the chest plate when we can afford to spend more diamonds. But that helmet right now is going to get fire protection. The boots look like they're going to get unbreaking. So let's try this set of boots as well. Just unbreaking three. Well, like I said, I need to get a grindstone installed down here so we can get some better enchantments going anyway. But folks, that is it for our skeleton spawner setup. I really hope you've enjoyed looking at this skeleton spawner with me and hopefully you folks found some methods that you liked from this video that you're going to give a try in your own world. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.